Okay, shall we start? Great. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on uh, uh, where you're joining us from. And thank you very much for taking the time to, uh, to join this conversation. Uh, in the next hour, we will be uh, discussing cooperation uh, between uh, art galleries and more specifically, uh, the impetus behind the creation of Galleries Curate, a uh, collaborative platform designed to express the dynamic dialogue between the uh, individual programs of 21 uh, international galleries. The first chapter of this collaboration is entitled Galleries Curate Ray, um, which is spelled R-H-E, uh, and consists of a series of exhibitions, performances, texts, um, and public interventions such as this one, uh, as well as a, as a whole digital platform, uh, which is themed around a universal and unifying subject, water. Uh, for those of you who are curious already and uh, haven't checked the platform yet, please uh, do visit uh, www.gallerycurate.com. Uh, six exhibitions are already visible there and more to come soon and it's updated frequently with some special contributions, uh, commission texts um, and please uh, remember to subscribe to our newsletter to uh, stay informed. My name is Clément de Lépine. I'm not going to spell that. Uh, among different things, I'm the co-director co of uh, the Art Fair Paris International um, and an independent curator based in Paris. Uh, and I'm staying here tonight uh, as the coordinator of Galleries Curate. Um, I'm in excellent company, uh, as, you, as you can see, uh, with illustrious interlocutors. Uh, I wish to thank uh, already all of you for uh, taking the time to share your insights on this beautiful project. Uh, I will let them introduce uh, themselves properly, uh, although they certainly don't need any introduction. But uh, uh, here with me are Mary Sabatino, uh, who is vice president uh, and partner of Galerie Le Long, um, originally founded in Paris, the New York location of Galerie Le Long and Co. opened in 1985, and Mary was appointed director there in 1991, and she's been named the partner of the gallery in 2007. Jose Curi is uh, founder and owner uh, with his wife, Monica Manzuto, uh, of Curi Manzuto Gallery, uh, established originally in Mexico in 1999, uh, and uh, in New York in 2018 uh, with a second location. Sadie Coles is the founder of uh, Sadie Coles HQ, her London-based gallery, which opened in the month of April 1997. And that same year, Johan Meyer, who is an art historian, uh, curator, and gallerist based in Berlin, opened with Thomas Rieger their eponymous gallery, Meyer Rieger, which is now a space in Berlin and a space in Karlsruhe. So tonight is the first um, of a series of conversations, uh, which will happen monthly and involve uh, different members of the project. Uh, the second conversation will take place on the 24th of February uh, with Marcio Botner, the director and uh, partner of Gentil Carioca in Rio, uh, Chantal Cruzel, the founder of Galerie Chantal Cruzel in Paris, and Jun Tirtaji, who is the founder of Ro Projects in Jakarta. And before we start, I just would like to uh, mention that our conversation is going to last uh, approximately 15 minutes, and we will keep 10 minutes at the end uh, to take uh, questions from the audience uh, which I understand you can send through the Q&A um, interface uh, on Zoom. Together we will discuss the origins of the project and each of our panelists uh, will uh, present uh, briefly speak of their uh, individual contributions to a Galleries Curate uh, Ray. For me personally, it started in the fall of 2020. Uh, I was contacted by Chantal Cruzel, uh, who invited me to join a pretty mysterious uh, weekly Zoom reunion uh, and on this occasion, I met some 15 co-founders of this initiative, which, believe me, felt uh, pretty intimidating at the time. Uh, and the group eventually grew to 21. Uh, and these Zoom reunions um, still happen weekly. And I feel sometimes like I should sell tickets to these meetings. Uh, <laughs> and then you introduced me to this beautiful idea of yours, uh, which was still in formation at the time, uh, in the sense that its final form had not been decided yet. Uh, and you offered me to coordinate uh, what would then become uh, Galleries Curate Ray, and I uh, am very thankful for that. Uh, but now we're out to provide our viewers and listeners with a bit more um, background information and context. Uh, and uh, you all have known each other for years now. Uh, you are sharing the representation of certain artists. Uh, you have occasionally sit together in the committee sessions of uh, major art fairs. Uh, you are in constant dialogue uh, for a while now, but it takes something more, uh, I think, to come together and uh, develop an idea together uh, and collaborate in the project together. 
And now my first question is for um, Mary uh, and Sadie, because um, sometimes it takes a village and sometimes it takes a phone call. And uh, while preparing for this conversation, I heard of a phone call uh, between the two of you, which kind of uh, put things in motion. And uh, I was hoping you could retrace with us the early chronology and, and perhaps the genesis of this collaboration. Uh, and Mary, maybe we could start with you, if, um, if that's all right. Uh, that's fine. Thank you, Clement. And thank you, Jose and Joachim and Sadie and Grace. Thank you for coordinating everything so quickly. Um, one thing is, I just want to mention that we, we are recording this conversation. So I don't know if, if even the phone call that I made to Sadie was as important for her as it was important for me. But it was in those first weeks of the lockdown um, in the United States, which had come after the lockdowns in Europe, when we were all sort of grappling of how bad would it be? We obviously never thought in mid-March that nearly a year later, we would be in almost the same position in terms of the virus, the pandemic, the changes in our industry. Um, but I we reached out to Sadie and we started chatting early one morning. I remember it was still quite dark in New York. And she was so open about what she was doing and how she was pivoting and what was going on and, and what she was going to do with staff and artists that I thought, wow, this was so great. Maybe we should get a few more people together. And so we started, she and I, to reach out to different colleagues and we made a, a WhatsApp group. And then we started meeting, I think, around the end of March. I think, was that right, Sadie? Do you think it was then, the end of March? Um, and we all, I would say that, you know, our tailors are fairly competitive, you know, and, as, and we, it's a small field in a certain way, even though we try to be global or we want to be global, but it's, in a, in a sense, it's small in terms of the global platform. And what was kind of amazing was just the openness, vulnerability, transparency, and honesty that everyone demonstrated and shared from the very beginning, which I had never experienced before, even though we had all, as Clement said, we worked together. Some of us share artists. We, some of us were on committees together. Some of us traveled together. Um, uh, we know each other a long time. Uh, I visited Jose in his first apartment gallery in Mexico City, um, climbing up the stairs. And I remember your exhibition, and that had to be in the 90s, I think. So we have a lot of history, but the pandemic made us find new things in ourselves and new things um, in each other. So I guess that was the start of the, I would say, support group. And then as things evolved, and you know, we all found a way to, to deal with the pandemic and deal with our businesses and realize that it was a long-term. We, we came up with the idea of doing something both cultural and something to concentrate our local audiences and make a global bond. So, Sadie, can you add to that? Um, well, I, I love what you've just said. I do believe that crisis uh, brings out the best in people. Um, and, and I think certainly um, the openness that everybody has shown um, has also resulted in many initiatives amongst dealers in the art world from South South, um, which you're also involved in, I think, to the um, uh, uh, Gallery Climate Coalition to um, all the other initiatives to, to the LA, the excellent gallery platform LA. I mean, I do think this is a time where because we were slowed down and desk bound or home bound, that everybody had a chance to really, to really spend time thinking about new initiatives and new ways to connect with their colleagues. And, and it has resulted in, in um, a very uh, creative openness. I think the initiative of um, what you do with that openness, uh, what you do with your networks is, is really crucial. And this particular network decided quite uh, information or supporting each other through um, specific strategies. 
the, the idea of curating something together um, as a symbol of our togetherness um, uh, was something that uh, Chantelle actually suggested uh, uh, initially. And it was, um, it just seemed to be the most uh, 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 dynamic way that we could express that, that togetherness. Yeah, I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned because it was Chantal who also who brought Clement to the table, though much later, um, uh, and also suggested the theme of water as a unifying theme. And and you mentioned um, uh, and, other... and what has happened with that with with <laughs> sorry, what did you say? I think we lost Sadie for a second. Um, but Sadie mentioned South House, and I also think, you know, of this um, um, another, you know, collaboratively minded uh, initiative, and but um, um, which um, uh, launched recently, um, and Mary and Jose are part of. Um, but Sadie uh, is also partaking in Condo, for instance. Uh, Jose, you've been opening up uh, your gallery space to. Um, to uh, other galleries um, as well. So um, in, in a way, you, you always you know, had strategies to collaborate uh, with your peers and colleagues. Um, but I'm curious to hear from uh, also Jose and Jochen uh, what, um, what the group um, uh, meant to you, uh, if I may say, because uh, uh, this particular context was a time to regroup. Uh, and uh, and um, I remember um, um, specifically a, a conversation that we had uh, Jorun, uh, where you shared, you know, your your uh, uh, feeling of loneliness, uh, and I was curious if we could uh, if we could uh, elaborate a little bit on that, please. Yeah, I, shall I start, Jose? Okay, yeah, I think uh, as Sadie and Mary have described already, we've bonded together uh, uh, with all those different galleries from all around the world. Uh, as Peter Freeman has very nicely said in his conversation last Saturday with his artists on the occasion of his exhibition, basically just to hold each other's hands. And mm -hmm. I think this uh, was a very nice description of the feeling we all had when we uh, came together, when we uh, reached out to friends and colleagues who share the same values, who have known each other for quite a while from different connections and collaborations. Although some of them, I have to say, I certainly got to know better in the last months in all those meetings every Monday. So the friendship and the trust amongst many of us was already there before the pandemic. But uh, I think in this specific moment, it certainly became deeper as many of us felt that there is a, an independency between galleries, which is far more important than let's say uh, competition. I think with the crisis uh, we have developed a more thoughtful kind of sensitivity about the ecosystem we're all part of. And uh, on one hand, there was this question of surviving the crisis. But on the other hand, many of us have found that our ecosystem already before the crisis mm -hmm. was not a very healthy one. It already felt somehow a bit empty or tired with the need for a change. And uh, not only because of the pace for galleries, artists, and other particip participants of the art world that became more and more painful. It also excluded so many different voices from all around the world and from different groups. And uh, I think we as galleries, and we feel that, for example, in our conversation with uh, galleries, we have a voice in, in this and uh, we can produce a change together. So I think the pandemic and uh, this urgency of different political questions also offered an opportunity for dialogues in which we all have engaged in in the last year. But in the beginning, um, I would say the most important thing for me was the conversation in general. There was no plan in the beginning for a joint exhibition or something like that. I guess we all just wanted to reach out to, in, uh, to each other and to ask, how are you? We wanted to exchange our ideas, hearing how everybody was navigating through the crisis, giving also advices, sometimes practical advices on different issues. But more importantly, there was a sense that uh, we are not alone in this, that we are together. And uh, 
this, uh, this is for me the most important thing. And uh, I would say that these conversations every Monday did a lot to keep my spirit up. And uh, it, it would have been certainly different uh, for me without those conversations, without everybody here and with all the other people from, from this group. So the act of solidarity amongst us is probably the most was probably intended yeah, from the beginning and it's still the most important thing for me, acts of solidarity or efforts to collaborate mm -hmm. that uh, happens not only as you said with Galleries Coates but also in other initiatives. Uh, but uh, I think back at the past year, the confrontation with the pandemic produced a sense of urgency mm -hmm. that became the basis of these collaboration. But for me, this one here with this group is especially beautiful with its first chapter, Ray, which is uh, for all of you don't know Greek so well, is uh, yeah, it's Greek and means everything that flows because we have somehow developed an exhibition format that is very much about the content, but also about being together as galleries, an intellectual exchange about collaboration and more specifically about the topic of water. So uh, for me, it's a beautiful experience to be part of it. Jose, do you want to add a few words? Ah, yes, thank you, Clement. I mean, it's hard to add something after my three colleagues. But yeah, I mean, what I can say is one of the perils that I've experienced throughout this crisis, this pandemic crisis, was being together with my colleagues. I can, I mean, just waking up and every Monday, rushing to my computer and connecting with my colleagues all around the world and just hearing what they had to say about their very own locality. It really helped, uh, I mean, us as a gallery, as a person, how to navigate this really on, on certain moment. So it was, really a, a beautiful moment to share. I was really looking forward every Monday, just meeting, chatting with our colleagues, sometimes for a couple of hours even, with no agenda, no agenda at all. We were all yeah, really uh, sometimes sharing what we had for breakfast. It was really a beautiful, beautiful moment that was a very endearing part of what we do, knowing my colleagues into this depth and helping us all together how to navigate mm -hmm. some really from very very practical things how do you deal with this we were all uh on the web trying to understand the world trying to uh, look for news and really for me the way to navigate the world was really listening to Sadie what she had to do what, what she had to say from London or Mary from New York. I mean, more than trying to read the New York Times or The Guardian. It was really the way to understand. Uh, so it was really very beautiful moment sharing this uh, time with all of them. Yeah, I remember from the very beginning, you uh, embraced a very uh, lighthearted approach. Um, and um, I remember our first conversation where you specifically told me that this is not another project that you want to worry about. Um, this should be something easy. And, um, and um, I quite appreciated that, appreciated that. And I feel like I wonder, I wanted to ask you, do you feel like maybe it's not necessarily a time to do less, but maybe it's a, it's a time to, which is auspicious to decelerate uh, maybe and, and uh, focus more on content driven initiatives. Um, I would say that Galleries Curate is certainly not a nonprofit because you know, uh, you're free to sell the artworks if you'd like to, but it's uh, certainly not a commercially motivated uh, initiative. And, um, and I feel like um, I don't want to sound too, Romantic, but uh, I feel like um, this platform was built also with the the, the idea of uh, building a sense of community um, uh, around it, and I don't know if that's uh, something that uh, you would agree to. Well, it, it was a very planned community. Um, 
And I think that one thing that was really important to all of us was how do we support our artists? You know, um, what do we do? You know, how do we keep the staff's spirits alive? You know, how do we, how are different people dealing with the financial repercussions? Um, how do you apply for a PPF fund? I mean, that was the US subsidy. And I remember a very specific, like Tim Blum telling Oliver Newton how to apply and where, what bank and this and that. I mean, people were, people were making a community in crisis. And I think the, cha the challenge for us now is that since the crisis is a long term, right? The crisis is not going to be over. Like with the, even with the vaccine, we're going to be living like this for a long time. You know, how do we look at new models, uh, whether they're for sustainability in London, there's a huge movement for that, whether it's in the collaboration of looking at other parts of the world. And as Joachim said, you know, how do we have more voices at the table? Um, how do we really be art dealers united and artists united? I mean, that was our original WhatsApp name, Art Dealers United. Um, which has been changed to something more elegant. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how do we give a space for artists to comment, to participate, uh, and at the same time when the business itself is challenging and right away, a lot of galleries offer their gallery um, for, for an artist to show. You know, like, like um, maybe you can speak of that, Joachim or Sadie, because. I think, Sadie, you had the idea originally of sort of sharing space. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I uh, was interested in this idea. Actually, it was, I think it was Tim Blum who, who actually suggested that we swap our spaces or offer our spaces to each other for you know, that if I had an, um, an artist in Los Angeles um, and um, I couldn't do the show that I was planning, I could just do it in his space. <laughs> we haven't, got, we haven't um, got that sophisticated yet, but I think it's a really good idea. And my collaboration with um, Tanya is, is sort of um, very much about that. My, part, my exhibition, my Ray exhibition is in Tanya's space in, in Berlin. Um, and uh, we very much wanted to see if we could combine elements of our program together. Um, Maybe uh, I ask Grace to, to jump to the images, uh, perhaps. So, Grace, would you mind? Thank you. Excuse me, Sadie, for interrupting. No worries. Okay, so this this is our the exhibition that we uh, did together with Tanya Layton in Berlin, and um, although it's a collaboration between both galleries, it's only taking place physically in her space in Berlin. It's not in my gallery, um, and I uh, that's for me that was kind of exciting that we kind of tried to make connections between um, artists in our program around a particular theme. Um, I mean, as um, Mary said earlier, um, one of the great things about this project is, is uh, giving us a focus, giving our staff a focus, giving our artists a focus. And it, that, it's been enormous fun working together with Tanya and her team um, on making these connections between our artists, none of whom, by the way, knew each other in, 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 uh, before. So that was good. This is an image of um, a, a monster Chetwin's uh, octopus and a Hokusai uh, erotic scene from the dream of the fisherman's wife on the left of this um, large wallpaper piece. And then on the right, there's the film of Oliver Larrick. Um, uh, monster Chetwin works with, with me in London and, and uh, Oliver obviously with, with Tanya. Um, but both of the artists are making work that, that deals with, image, with um, themes of transformation and fluidity and um, we thought that they made a very good connection in terms of Ray and the idea of water as a, as a stateless transforming uh, uh, matter. 
again, that's a sculpture by Oliver Larrick with his film. Um, and uh, the sculpture is a sort of hybrid of forms. Um, and in the film, uh, there are these constant uh, representations of uh, humans morphing into animals from hundreds of different animated films. Um, the work, the two works on the wall on the right hand side about, are by Michelle Abels and she delights in the slippage of image um, and the both uh, images there contain uh, digital and analog imagery and there's this feeling of kind of like a slippage between those two uh, modes of, of presentation and uh, production. Uh, this is a work by an artist we work with in London called Alvaro Barrington, and it's a uh, six panel um, uh, 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 installation, which is actually six separate works, but these are clouds, representations of clouds, um, sens sensual and, and majestic, uh, which, which um, are kind of inspired by the transient states between water and air and directly reference JMW Turner's tempestuous seascapes. Thank you, Sadie. Sorry, it's a bit difficult on a train. I can <laughs> so imagine, but you've done, yeah, no, you've done uh, uh, wonderfully. <laughs> Thank you. Update us on the go. Um, I think it's also important to to uh, address the fact that uh, water as a theme uh, has many many interpretations and um, and also um, the the name Ray was uh, meant to evoke um, uh, Heraclitian philosophy and the principle that um, you never swim twice in the same river. So um, the state of uh, impermanence and, and water just like culture is always in flux. And, um, and so that's uh, why the team was also uh, chosen for, uh, you know, it's uh, um, uh, versatility, if I may say. Um, I think we can now move on to Jochen, um, who will be talking about the work of Helen Mira, uh, who was a solo exhibition at the gallery in Karlsruhe uh, at the moment, although the gallery is closed uh, because of the lockdown in Germany. But, it's very much present with us. Yeah, yeah, and I have to admit that I'm talking now about an exhibition that I haven't seen myself in person because the show is taking place in Karlsruhe and I'm in Berlin, which is on the other side of Germany. But uh, I'll try to do my best uh, because it's an overview of Mira's work from the past uh, 23 years and uh, many of the works uh, I know very well and are very dear to me because I feel very close also to her work. The exhibition has a German title. The German title is Gletscherbachfloß, which you can simply translate as Glacial River Raft. Um, in Mira's works, various media convene, textile, language, film, and sound, and they have participated in a conceptual meeting with classical genres such as sculpture, painting, and drawing. The exhibition itself consists of a map, a record, different cotton bandings, a wall painting, sculptures, and a film, of which you see the installation right now. And of course, all the works are referring, re referring to each other in a dense network of illusions and translations, all reflecting the topic uh, of water, not only as a fluid or a frozen element, but also as a kind of a socio-poetic statement and I wanted to present to you shortly now one of the works in the exhibitions, Mira's film map of the 81st degree parallel north and maybe we can go to the next picture and have a quick look at the film. It's a 60 millimeter silent film that uh, transformed the 81st parallel, which is located in the northern Arctic zone into alternating watercolor washes, changing between blue, light blue and white. Starting at the prime meridian and heading eastwards, the parallel 
of the 81st degree passes amongst others, the Atlantic Ocean, the Arctic Ocean, and going back between Russia and again the Arctic Ocean, Canada, Greenland, and back to the Atlantic. So the colors are based on that imaginary intersection between water, which is represented by the paintings in black, summer water and winter ice painted in light blue, and only ice which are painted in white. Mira has painted the watercolors directly onto the clear film stock after a very precise geographic system. At a scale of one foot to one degree longitude, the film is 360 feet long and it takes 11 minutes to encompass the globe and to travel around the world without touching any land at all, simply because there's only water or ice on the 81st parallel. Of course, the film is also an emphasis on the physicality of film that references yeah, structural experiments from the 70s. Simultaneously, it's also uh, an attempt to lesser spatial expenses and render imaginary experience in a distilled form. It's dialogue between maybe a structural rigor and a very yeah, poetic dimension, I would say. The film is projected with a 60 millimeter film projector in the exhibition. And the more it is projected, the more traces on the film become part of the projection itself, which is intended by the artist. Maybe we go to the next picture where you see the original hand-painted film, which is also part of the exhibition as a, kind of, uh, as a kind of sculptural piece, because of course the film that we are screening is then a copy from that original hand-painted film. And finally, if you go to the last image, executed in a similar approach, we are also showing different cotton bendings, like here, again, the map of the 59th degree south. In this scale, the measurement is different. It's a scale of one inch to one degree longitude. And the technique here is watercolor on cotton. Again, an impression of time and space that spreads out on the wall of the gallery at a length of 360 inches. That draws kind of an, yeah, an invisible circle and gives the physical presence of the 59th parallel here in green and blue for land and water. And if you look at the image, you see also a very small shelf. And on that, cell, on that shelf, there's another bending place, which is only in white because uh, this parallel is located on the 87th parallel, uh, which is only running in the Southern Arctic zone. And uh, there is only white, so the bending is also only white. Is uh, some words about yeah, mm -hmm. the scene. Thank you, Johan. Um, I feel like I should add as well that um, while uh, Helen Mira has a solo exhibition in the space in Karlsruhe, um, your full contribution to the project also includes a new project by Melvin Moti in the Berlin Gallery, which hasn't opened to the public yet, mm -hmm. um, but uh, will soon with his uh, most recent film as well, right? Yes, yes, we are just waiting to uh, be able to open the gallery to the public again, but we can't foresee when this will be, in the worst case, not before, probably March or April, because we are under very strict lockdown at the moment in Germany. Well, thank you very much, Johan. Um, I'm, I'm moving on to... Um, to uh, Mary. Um, Mary Gary Lelong and co has a, a very generous exhibition up which um, uh, includes I think 16 artists, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and you will be um, presenting uh, two works, one by Alfred Ojar and one by uh, Sildo Meireles. So when the idea for the show came on and I thought, well, some of the artists in the gallery work with water. And then I found out that most of the artists in the gallery are working with water in some theme. And I couldn't even include all of them in this, um, as you said, generous show. Uh, the two works I chose, and so this is an installation view, and you see on the right-hand side a beautiful light box by Catherine Yass uh, about the last manned lighthouse um, in the south of England. You see a Fikre Jebre Jesus on the left, Michelle Stewart, 
uh, one Usle straight ahead and a Pita coin to the right. Um, the two works I chose, oh, and then, um, yeah, thanks, Grace, you can keep that. And then a room that had an Anna Mendieta film called Silhouette de Arena, um, Silhouette of Sand, which is a newly discovered film with her body and then the water over it, and an early piece by Jama Plentz, The Freud's Children. And this piece actually has water coming over the hands, so you hear the sound of water as you're looking at the Mendieta. Uh, the two works I chose um, the were quite political in orientation, and I think water uh, water will be the next war. You know, I think access to water, uh, if if not already, and as climate you know change becomes more and more frightening, um, who has access to water? Where there is drought is going to be one of the major um, issues. However, this piece uses water as a sign of refugees, which though this is a piece that Alfredo made in 1990, very classic light box with mirrors, a kind of almost textbook illustration of Alfredo where he's playing with, you know, is reality mirrored to us or are we reflect reflected in it? You see the South China Sea, this was the sea that um, Vietnamese refugees crossed um, in the 90s. Um, they, the politically incorrect way was they were referred to as the boat people. But in fact, they were refugees who then um, lived in Hong Kong, were taken to detention camps in Hong Kong, where many of them lived for 10 years. And so Alfredo, who always does his research in person, was on the boats where the refugees were intercepted and then visited the camp where he took the photographs of which you will see on the back. Grace, can you show that? Yeah. So this is a young girl. Most She may have been born in one of the camps and you only see her in fragments and she's being held by her mother and her mother in fragments. And you also see yourself, which makes the question, how are we implicated in this global crisis? And though the piece was done in 1990, we are now in a time where there's a greater movement of refugees. It's the largest movement of humankind in the 20th century, even after World War II, which was the, 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 uh, up until now, the greatest movement of, of people who were displaced. The second piece I chose is by Silda Morellis. And um, it's very, this is actually documentation. It's not the actual piece. So this is called Aquarium. And on the left is a glass of pure gold. Um, Grace, can we see the detail? Yeah. And on the, and you see there's even the meniscus of the, uh, of the, of the water. And on the right is a glass of water. And of course, uh, Morellis is making reference to the water crisis all over the world and particularly in Brazil at this moment where Brazil is home to a great quantity of the world's water but yet there are water shortages everywhere and at this time I remember the water would be turned off in Sao Paulo for like days you know you get it for a couple of hours in the morning um, it would be turned off in Rio there was a, uh, an incredible water crisis and that's just the beginning so um, this piece, which is very simple, almost conceptual, even though it is real gold, uh, is a metaphor for contemporary society and what our future holds. And Silda would always say about this piece, you know, you can't drink gold, which is true. And the title of the work, um, Aquohum, is, is the combination of uh, uh, aqua and ohum in Latin, right? Uh, yes, uh, water well, and which gold. is water and gold. Okay, oh, very nice. Thank you very much. Um, Jose, can we hear a little bit from you? Certainly. Abraham Cruz Villegas. Abraham Cruz Villegas, that's right. And just before that, I mean, I think that it was very important for us after all our meetings that they would suddenly go into the physical realm, no? into a physical realm. So it was a wonderful idea to, that we could pour this energy into what we know what to do or we love what to do, which is doing exhibitions. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, I mean, as Mary pointed out, it's, 
art is always at the first, at the foremost of our thinking, of our conversation. So it was beautiful that we could put this energy into doing exhibitions, showing the work of artists. Mm -hmm. So what we try to do is, I mean, we're asking ourselves how, I mean, how should we address this either in a more representational, in a more metaphorical, poetic, so what we try to do is try to go into the matter itself. If we were longing for physical things, just seeing things on, on screen, we wanted to go with works that would appeal to a certain uh, physicality, to a certain materiality. So that's why it's, it's basically, uh, it's, it's not, not representative works. So, with this one from Abraham Cruz Villegas, which comes from a very different uh, origin uh, uh, in terms of, of the theme of water. It's, these are called blind self-portrait and it's just a, a blue self-portrait. So it's just asking how much do you think of water? I mean, with a very straightforward uh, perception of blue, no? So it's more about creating a atmosphere for the whole exhibition and the next works are a set of uh, four or five water stone uh, river stones that Gabriel Orozco collected in many trips driving to the coast to the pacific coast of Mexico and actually we spent this I mean many vacations driving and crossing this river the Papagayo river in Acapulco, and he always loved how the how these stones were carved, and people on the on the on the side of the highway were selling the stones, which is a beautiful. I mean, it's like selling uh, sculptures. So he for for many years he collected them and thought, what can he do? From I mean, they're already beautiful. So how can he dialogue with them? And at the end, he decided to create all these forms also kind of trying to uh, mimic the river working on them. And then we, uh, then, it, then it's Minerva Cuevas, who she always has this sort of uh, political uh, approach to materials, this uh, uh, political approach to themes. So this is a, a series that she's been collecting for a while, these sea landscapes in flea markets, and then dipping them in tar, in chapopote, we would say in Spanish, creating another uh, or a different line of horizon on, on them. And I think it's quite evident the the, what she's trying to convey with this. And just to, there you go. And just to try to have a, this, her, uh, this political approach she does. Uh, a few years ago, probably 15 years ago, uh, she appropriated and deconstructed, if we can have the next slide, please. She appropriated and deconstructed the corporate campaign or corporate slogans of companies, in this case, Evian, which is, uh, uh, it was just Evian, una condición natural, and obviously, egalité, una condición natural. So we wanted to add this political aspect to the show. And as well as in the idea of approaching nature, in our next slide, the work of Gabriel Curi. And if I can have the next slide, which is exactly that one. I mean, just thinking of uh, randomness or chance in nature. Would it be, what would it, I mean, I, I like the idea of finding a pearl. Would it be as difficult as getting the cash lottery? Scrap, uh, having a ticket and then just finding that it's just a kind of playful poetic way to approach 
nature. And in the last uh, slide, this is the work of Damian Ortega, and it's uh, the Titanic, which probably talks, I mean, can be self evident about the failure in us dealing with the water, with a matter of water. So that's more or less the show we plan to. Fantastic. So, Is that in Madrid? That's in Palacio Cristal, and it's a, so, uh, a show he had a few years ago. And that uh, Titanic, it comes from the original plans that he, he found on the, on the internet, the original plans of the Titanic. Yes. So it was very beautiful. And it's, it's a scale, I think it's one to a hundred of the, the Titanic. Thank you, Jose. Um, I guess, I mean, I thought I had a question, but turns out I have a, a more of an observation, which uh, happens uh, in, these, uh, uh, in these talks, as you know. Um, but I just wanted to point out that um, uh, although it wasn't imposed, um, the vast majority of the participants to Galleries Curate uh, Array chose to organize a physical exhibition uh, and thought of the online presentation as a complement to uh, to say physical exhibition. And for instance, some chose the primary location or the secondary location of the gallery space um, and included the exhibition in their uh, current gallery pro um, exhibition program. Some chose to organize a special project um, in a remote, uh, sometimes uncanny location. Uh, some plan to do it um, across different cities. And um, although, you know, undoubtedly an online platform has an extended reach, uh, it exists for a longer time uh, and can include much more information. Um, in my opinion, there, these physical um, exhibitions also very much ground uh, galleries curate uh, locally. And um, that makes me believe that this project, although uh, uh, spreading nations and cultures, um, is also anchored locally and within a specific time frame and um, a specific territory as well, which is the territory of the, of the galleries. Um, and uh, maybe now it's time for us to move on to questions from the audience. Um, and I already have a question uh, here from um, Capucine Gros. Um, do you think this crisis can be an opportunity to give up or replace, or at least rethink, the pretty unsustainable model of incessant art fairs? and therefore their non-stop demand for fast productions, sales, and the cost of slower and perhaps more profound works? It's an open question that you will be able to, to answer more precisely than, uh, than me, so I leave it up to you. Well, I think that already before the pandemic we were going through, I, uh, and that's something we shared in our Monday meetings, we're already uh, questioning ourselves much the model we were uh, living. I mean, this fast pace. So we were already, all of us, I think, uh, finding uh, strategies or finding ways to act in, uh, in, a, in, in, in different ways. So it didn't come new to us. How could we ask ourselves more deeply, I mean, what do we want to do? What, I mean, with the moment we're living in. So I think it was already a, a question that was up in the air. I don't know if my colleagues want to. <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, I'll share a, a, a personal story, which is on my last crazy business trip, um, which included um, uh, Paris, Basel, um, uh, Copenhagen, I can't remember, Copenhagen, uh, and then Los Angeles before returning to New York, all of this in about a week. And this was kind of like the normal way. I left my engagement ring, which was a family antique in the bathroom of the hotel in Copenhagen. So of course I lost it. 
And I remember I was really bereft and having at the dinner in Los Angeles with the hammer and talking to the woman next to me. And she said, maybe your lifestyle is wrong. <laughs> um, and it's true, the pace was you know, unsustainable and it took a crisis for us to really look at, well, how are we, how are we representing the artists who we work with? The negative of this is that every artist in our gallery has had multiple shows canceled, like multiple, you know, and the more shows they had, the more that are canceled. So the negative, of course, I mean, I think art fairs, I don't know if I, uh, if, I don't really want to answer the art fair part, that's part of the system, but the biennials, art fairs, exhibitions, there is such a pace, but at the same time, the pace had many positive things in which artists' works were disseminated in a, in a wide um, global world. Uh, and now doing it virtually for the majority of them, it's not satisfying at all, you know. Um, and if we suffer from Zoom fatigue, they really suffer from Zoom fatigue even more. Mm -hmm. Sadie, do you want to add anything? Um, well, I think Ray and Gallery's Curate is really an expression that we all get from making real exhibitions, making exhibitions, showing, thinking about art, showing art. Um, but, and I do think that, that, and it's a wonderful expression of that, but, and, and I know that every single colleague that I have around the world is desperate to get back into their galleries, to work with their artists, to make exhibitions, both in the galleries and, and to assist in the museum uh, exhibitions of their artists. And, but I do think that once the pandemic is over, you know, we will all be, want to be together looking at art. Um, so I think there will be a huge pent-up demand um, to see art, uh, to talk about art, to be in a hotel bar late at night talking about art. Um, so in a way, I think that the art fairs um, will remain uh, an essential part of the ecosystem um, and will, re will remain sites where you do meet new curators you do meet new collectors. You do you do come across as a as a professional. You do come across uh, new artists. So I do think that they will remain an essential part of the ecosystem. But it may be that we all, having had this pause, will um, be thinking where we want to go in terms of uh, um, selecting the art fairs we do, um, and whether or not we want to be doing them at the same pace. Johan, you seem to agree with this. Yeah, I agree a lot with it, of course. Uh, I think, uh, as Sadie said, we need the physical ground uh, where we can see our collectors, curators, artists, and we see the whole community again. and. Uh, and uh, art fairs like Basel, uh, if, if they will take place, or other fairs, offer this opportunity. On the other side, we find ourselves, of course, in the contradiction, and I can only repeat that the pace was painful for everybody involved, and, uh, and, and that through this crisis, we hopefully are learning and uh, 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 slowing down this pace, and uh, I think the only way to slow it down is to make choices and, uh, and, and to decide for what you want to do, where you want to participate and what you can also skip and not do. And of course, these are difficult choices uh, because we have, I think we as gallerists, we have both sides in us. We want, we want to show our artists, we want to give them a platform, we want to present them, we want them also to show the work in different contexts, we want to show them in Asia as well as in Latin America, as well as in parts of Europe. But on the other side, I think uh, with all the things we've reflected in the past months and already before, uh, we feel it's probably not 
only right what we have done. And so uh, we have to make choices and it will be a clash of probably an, an interior conflict that we all have to resolve for ourselves. But uh, that's why I'm so happy about this initiative because uh, it's globally and locally at the same time. It, uh, it addresses our local audiences, but it's uh, included in a global in a global conversation with uh, mm -hmm. with uh, colleagues and friends that we appreciate. So it offers both somehow, and it's for sure much more sustainable, and it's much more content related. It's also reassuring for my other line of business that you're not completely dismissing the art fairs. So. <laughs> um, I think uh, this also, um, uh, these uh, answers of yours have also addressed um, an earlier question that we had in, uh, in, terms, of, uh, in terms of virtual collaboration. Um, we have a comment, which I'd like to relate to you. I would like to say that you, all of you are incredibly lovely people. And it's so clear when you support this artist with your work and love to art and through all the fears and insecurities, stay strong and healthy. Soon we can share one only plus again. Um, that's a very encouraging words. Um, and maybe before closing the conversation, I just wish to take a minute to, um, to thank uh, my interlocutors, uh, of course, uh, Sadie, Jose, Jorhan. Um, Sadie, props to you for uh, um, uh, talking to us uh, from a train. Um, Mary, um, especially, uh, I wish to thank you for, uh, because it was your idea to bring us tonight um, to, together for this event. Uh, when I say tonight, it's the afternoon for you. But, and of course, in our collective name, um, I sincerely thank all the viewers and listeners uh, for their time. And I also express uh, my most profound gratitude to Grace Hong, who has been orchestrating behind the scenes and without whom this conversation could have not happened. Um, but most, impo most importantly, we are uh, certainly indebted to uh, the artists uh, who have uh, been contributing and supporting the project uh, and over 50 artists uh, without whom uh, Galleries Curate Ray would still be uh, just an idea. Um, I strongly encourage you to visit gallerieskurate.com and hope you will connect again on the 24th of February uh, for the second part of this conversation series. Um, again, Marcio Botner, um, uh, Chantal Cruzel and June Tirtaji will be uh, talking more specifically on the importance of uh, raising awareness uh, with our own tools and, and delve a bit more into the details of our, of our team, uh, Water. Um, I wish you all a good rest of the day or evening and, and thank you again for, uh, for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Clément, very much. My pleasure. <laughs> thank you, Clément. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.